490 in your hymnals, Revive Us Again, 490. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 490. organization down there. How was your afternoon? I'm exhausted. If I fall asleep, forgive me. Like if I'm in the middle of everything and I fall asleep, like you do to me, forgive me. If we had a shelter down by the lake, couldn't we go down there on a night like tonight to have church? Well, what are you waiting for? We keep talking about it. Every, how long have we talked about it? I'm just going to do it. At least set a tent up down there for all summer, and then we'll just go down there when, really, we want to put a road in, and, and uh, we've already checked on putting uh, plumbing and electric, and you, you sat down there. It's gorgeous. We want to put a cabin down there. So that if you need to get away, like we won't call it the dog house. <laughs> but if you need a place to get away to. And then when you come, you'll like it. You'll be glad to be in the dog house. But we really do. We have beautiful. If you've never walked out there, you need to do that. Well, these all, all, all that when you look straight back. Some of that's bodies. There's this tree down on the shore. That tree back this way, that's her, but if you walk on it, she won't care. She shoots, but she misses you. But that, I'm just, that tree, then all the way that way to the other trees, that's all ours. So all that frontage, just if you walk out there, we talk about putting a gazebo out there, but the mosquitoes, when they come, kind of big. But now's a good time, because I don't know that they're that bad, but we really talked about, we talked about in the back of the fellowship hall where the, some of us park, we talked about making that like a stair steps and just going out there and having church. We can do that, can't we? I mean, we don't have to go right there. We can go sit in the middle of the parking lot, but it would be nice just sometimes say, hey, let's run down by the water. Wouldn't it be fun? We got it. We ought to do it. That or we talk about putting a sliding roof in. Like the football stadiums where the whole thing will slide. Some of you just buy anything, wouldn't you? Some of you are thinking about that. Like, well, can you do it? Would you do that? 
Yeah, we're going to try that. Want to pray? How many of you have something on your heart? Let's do this two steps. You have something you're praying about. You need an answer. You need an answer soon. You're somebody you're praying for. You want to see God do something in their life. Kenny, don't quit praying. Just because God doesn't answer when you think he should. Right? Pray with me. Our Father, we know that we can have the things that we desire and ask if we believe. You said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Thank you for your promises when we pray. Tonight, hands went up, said there's something that they need an answer about soon. God, would you answer prayer? That would be such an encouragement to them. And when they share it with us, it's an encouragement to us. Hands went up when they heard that there's somebody they're praying for that they'd like to see God work and change their life. And I know you can do that, God. Help us to keep praying. You said that we ought not faint, we ought not be weary, but we ought to keep praying. Help us keep praying. Help us to pray hard. Tonight we ask you to speak to us. There's something that we need to hear. There's something that needs to happen, that needs to change in our lives. Lord, we didn't come just to say we came, but we came so that you could do something. We came so that you could bring about that change, so that you could show us. Maybe there's something that we've hidden or put off or ignored. Maybe there's something we've denied or avoided. And I pray tonight that you'll just get a hold of us. We know the best life is the God-blessed life. The best life, the devil thinks, is when we do whatever we want. And we know that that is not true. So, Lord, work tonight, please. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. I pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Page 496. 496. Channels only. Ushers, will you come as they come? There are several things we want you to be aware of. Number one, tomorrow morning, jail if you're interested, and that is for the men, 8.30 in the morning. Tuesday, the ladies' birthday dinner, Hacienda, that's at 6.30. You're aware, I'm, I'm sure, of that. If your birthday is in the month of May, they pay. I, I think, I've never been to one. I don't know if they do this, but they're supposed to pay for your dinner. Midweek, 7 o'clock on Wednesday our youth group meets, King's Kids, done for the year. Hard to believe. Seems like we just started. 
and then noon on Thursday, the ladies are doing lunch for birthdays. If you can make both, great. If you can make one, great, both at Hacienda and then the Portage Manor Nursing Home Service is a new one. I appreciate Fred doing that, reaching out. Boy, they need it. God's keeping track of that, isn't he? Hello? God keeping track of that? I think it's great. I appreciate that. I have a heart. I wish I had more time. I'd love to just, they all need it. I love to go to the hospital and just go room to room and pray with everybody in the hospital, really. And maybe I'll do that in my spare time. So we're glad you're here. How many of you are glad you're here? How many of you can't wait to get out of here? Lisa, do you have a guess? Wonderful. Younger, much younger brother. Good to have you there. <laughs> much younger. Anybody else visiting? Anybody else want a candy bar? David, did you get a candy bar? Your brother-in-law is in charge of that. Jonathan, what'd you do? Eat it? He licked it. I think I saw him lick it and then he pulled it. Poor Jonathan. Aren't you glad you don't live with him? Sorry. No offense. <laughs> Sorry, Lee. How many of you are glad you don't live with me? Yeah, you don't know the half of it. How many of you believe my wife is godly? More godly than you'll ever be. Unless you live with me. And when cloning comes up, I've ordered 100. I'm already in for 100, so I'm coming to your house. Thank you, John. <laughs> oh, happy Mother's Day again, mothers. You sure deserve it. Nothing harder than being a mom. Right? Now, I don't know, but my poor mom. My mom always used to say that. If I die, if I die young, she'd say, if I die young, it'll be because of you. And she did die young. So I felt pretty bad about that. But I, you know, when God changed my life, when I was young, she was. She was bailing me out of jail and taking me to the emergency room. I'd get hurt. And, and she'd always say, You're, see these gray hairs? Oh, well. Mine are from my wife, but I gave my. <laughs> None of you are listening. I got your number. Ready? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, please, please show us how to give. Receiving's easy. Show us how to give. Work tonight. Well, there are needs maybe that someone here just isn't even talking about. You know that need. God, all of us, I think, most of us have someone on our heart that need you to change their life, Lord. I'm thinking of someone and just pleading and praying. And I know that right in this room, someone's thinking of that person. They would love to see you change their life. Work tonight, Lord. Help us to see you work. You're going to work. Don't let us miss it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
502. 502. And can it be? Let's all stand, shall we? 502. special course on the piano. After she's finished, Dee is going to come. She's here visiting from Alabama. There's Ray. Raise your hand, Dee. <laughs> so I've asked her if she, if she wanted to do something. She said, yes, I do. So she's going to play after Sarah.
Boy, that is hard to get him to say amen, preacher. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's not even listening to me. I, he can't hear me. Huh? Like the prodigal son, I wandered in darkness, and I traded my
Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. I'm just up here fussing because I don't. God and I are having a fuss. And he's winning. Jonah chapter 4. Some of you are under the misconception that all these. I, by the way. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this. But I like it when you think I'm preaching to you. I pray for you. I think about you. I prepare messages. And then you ask me, was that meant for me? What do you think? No, I'm talking to somebody I hope, you know, will hear this someday. Yeah, yes, it's for you. And if you take it the wrong way, I can't help that. I just do what I'm told. I'm not mad. I've tried to make it always a practice never to preach mad or angry. But some of you have, I think, the misconception that everything's for you and nothing's for me. And that's not true. That's not true. When I pray and study and look over things and work on it, I ask God to show me me and show me you and speak to me and I am his proving ground. I want it to work in me. It doesn't mean it all works and it doesn't mean that he's failing. It means it doesn't work on me. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Jo this is one of those I've had a while and, and uh, I just hate it when I need preaching. Just let me get it out. I just hate it. Because I want you to need it. I don't want to need it. But I need it. And I hate being human. I, I hate failing. And I hate having flaws and being normal. I just hate it. Where's Doug? Speaking of that. Is he okay? He's fishing still. Been gone like three months. About time. Sorry, we we don't embarrass you when you come in. Hurry up, sit down. I'm in a hurry. God bless you. We want you to feel like family. Jonah chapter four. Jonah chapter four. The worst attitude you can ever have. Jonah chapter 4, the worst attitude you can ever have. I know a lot of good people, but they have crummy attitudes. I know a lot of people that are spiritual, but they have crummy attitudes. I know a lot of people that mean well. They'll tell you they mean well. They have a crummy attitude. I would love would love to stand up here and say, everything else I preach, I need this one I don't. The fact of the matter is, I told God, I said, look, God, look right here. I know he can see. See that one? That's a good one. How about that one? This is what I go through. I'm letting you in on the secret. This is what I paid all that money for, studied all those years for. How about that one, God? Okay, got one more. How about that one? No, I want you to go back to that other one. No, that it. No, 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 no. So God and I are having a little bit of a hissy fit with each other, and I'm throwing it, and he's watching. But, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of struggles in my life, but my biggest struggle really is my crummy attitude. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. I love the Lord, man. Listen to me. I love the Lord with all my heart. And I don't know what my, what my wife would say, but, but I love the Lord with all my heart. And I study his word every day. And I pray, and I pray for you, and I plead for you. There was a pastor's wife here at the banquet Friday night, and she said, my husband talked about the fact that you pray for him every day. And I said, you tell him 
That is the truth, and God knows that I pray for him every day. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I said I'm trying. And yet I still struggle. And I don't know if that helps you, but it ought to. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah wrote the book. That's what really intrigues me when I read this book, that he's the guy that copied all this down. And if I wrote something about me, I certainly wouldn't put anything bad. But he was, you know, hey, and he really ends it bad. This is one of the videos I'm going to rent when I get to heaven. It's how this book ends. Verse 1. But, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Look at me, look at me, look at me. What happened? He went to Nineveh after much persuasion. And after God persuading him in the belly of the fish, he shows up to Nineveh. He makes that trip. Here's what really, you know, I've thought about this. I'll think about it till I die. I don't think from chapter 1, when God said go to Nineveh and he said no, I don't think his attitude changed. Look at me, look at me. His actions changed, but his attitude didn't change. And you can go, you say, Pastor, you sound like you're talking to me. Listen, if it was legal, I'd come out there, say it, and slap you. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to you, trying to help you. I think Jonah went to Nineveh and did the right thing. And like no other, no other revival, we sing revivals again tonight, like no other revival, something happened in Nineveh that's never been recorded in history, ever. But he did it with a crummy attitude. You, you can be guilty of doing the right thing, but doing it with a crummy attitude. I'm not here to get you to do the right thing. I think you're pretty good at it. What I want to do tonight, and I guess I have to listen. What I want to do tonight is I want to tune up or tweak my attitude. Verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord. You can pray and have a crummy attitude. Huh? Remember this morning? It probably won't work, nevertheless. Isn't that a great story? I mean, don't you all act like I wrote them. I didn't. I just think you're great. So I just bring them out. And I think it's great when Peter said, we, well, look, we have fished all night. We know it's going to happen. You can tell us to throw that net anywhere you want, but it ain't going to work. But because you said it, we'll do it. There's a lot of Christians that live like that. We go through the motions and our, our actions are right, but our attitude isn't. Think about it. You've got to have both. If you've got the right actions but a bad attitude, you think God is sitting up there going, I just love it when Vito does the right thing. Boy, he has a bad attitude. But that's okay. You think God says, man, old Vito, he has the best attitude but he's lazy. He doesn't do a thing. But that's okay. He's got a good attitude. You've got to do both. You've got to do the right thing with the right attitude. Verse 2, he prayed unto the Lord. And he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my say? You know what a bad attitude usually has with it? Stubbornness. John is telling God how God ought to think. Now, I've never done that. He said to him, John talks to God, and he says, look, I know I'm talking to you, and I know you're God, but hey, remember what I said? When you come to 
God, he wants you to ask him. He doesn't need your advice. You're coming to God to ask him for what you need. You're not coming to God to tell him what you think he ought to do. Look at me. When you pray, when the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, that's what that's talking about. You're not coming to God to tell him how he ought to be God or how he ought to answer your prayer. You're coming to God asking him that, that his will will be done. So Jonah, in all the brashness, comes and he says, Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled under Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God. Those with a crummy attitude know what they're supposed to know. We're not talking about full-fledged rebels. We're talking about people that, that do the right thing, they pray, and like Jonah says, he knows about God. He's theologically accurate. But you still can have a crummy attitude. You can do the right thing, you can pray, and you can know what you're supposed to know, but you can have an oh, Listen to me. Look at me and listen to me very carefully because I'm trying to help you and help our country. I'm trying to help this world. Jesus left us in the world to make an impact. And I tell you what, a lot of people, lost people, other Christians, man, Christians are not going to church. Christians are giving up on God, and it isn't because God did something to them. It's because of the crummy attitude of Christian. Complain. Some of you, when I go long, you leave here. Man, that was long. You know what? You ought to get a new hobby. Maybe you need it. Maybe it wasn't long enough for you because obviously it didn't work. You say, I, I don't like this. I don't either because if I was out there, I might feel the same way. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. It doesn't matter if you're a deacon. You can have a crummy attitude. He said, verse, verse 2, I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentance thee of the evil. He, Jonah knew what God could do in Nineveh. He wasn't surprised by that. He didn't walk through Nineveh and say, yet 40 days and, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And they all turn to God. Jonah didn't go, wow, I never thought that would happen. He knew exactly what God could do. And the incredible thing is that he tells the truth about it. Wouldn't you have buttered it up a little bit? Would you have made it complicated? I mean, here's what, look at verse 3. Therefore, now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Isn't that a dumb statement? I just wish I was dead. God's the guy for the job. God can take care of you. Jonah's got, that to me is, you say, he's just having a hard time. And maybe he grew up in a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Verse 4, then said the Lord, what the Lord gets right to the point. Doest thou well to be angry? You know what Jonah was angry about? His crummy attitude. Is it good? Does heaven rejoice when someone gets saved? Did all of Nineveh get saved? A lot of rejoicing going on in heaven. I mean, you, you can't be a Christian and not get excited about someone changing someone else, about God changing someone else's life. And here you have Jonah. God's not going to use him. God isn't going to go, I'll use Jonah. I sure hope he's saved. God, God's not going to use him if he's not saved. 
It's possible to be a Christian. It's possible to be used by God. It's possible to be a part of one of the biggest things that God ever does. And have a crummy attitude. I don't know what sets you off. I'll tell you what sets me off. Little stuff. Little, little, not, not big stuff. Little stuff. I mean, goofy stuff. If you knew about it, you'd fire me. If my wife ever comes clean, she tells you the truth about me, you'll get rid of me so quick and wish you would have got rid of me 29 years ago. I wouldn't use a guy like Jonah. Guy with a bad attitude. Verse 5. God asked him if he does well. Is it good for you? Jonah, how's that anger going for you? What works you up? Here's mine. Here's mine. Turn light. I'm driving. And you don't use your turn light. Drives me nuts. You say, well, there's bigger things in the world, Pastor, more important than that. Well, then you follow me around. You order some clones, too, and follow me. Because while I'm following you, maybe you need to follow me and help me. Because I know, if either it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, put a sign on your car. My turn light doesn't work. <laughs> if you got it, use it. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth. sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. I tell you what became of the city. They all turned around from their evil and turned to God. You know what Jonah's thinking? He's thinking they don't mean it. They're going to turn back. He's thinking they were insincere. Listen to me. When, you're, when you have a crummy attitude, you're always skeptical of other people. You don't trust anybody. They don't mean it. They're not sincere. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. <laughs> God, God is so merciful. Who else would put up with our foolishness? Who else would put up with this kind of junk? God makes a gourd so that Jonah can have relief from his grief. And it says that it came up to, to give him shadow and relieve him of the heat and his problem. And, and I, if I was God, would you torment Jonah? Would you go, listen boy, I'll help your attitude. Wouldn't you have stuff coming up out of the ground slapping him? Thank God. Thank God he's full of mercy. Thank God he's compassionate. Because he puts up. We have a hard time putting up with each other. But God doesn't have a hard time putting up with us. Because he's God. Verse 7, but, <laughs> and I, I, I'm always thankful to get to verse 7, sorry, but God prepared a worm. <laughs> when the morning rose the next day, it smoked the gourd that it withered. Uh-huh. You think you got a bad attitude now, Jonah, check this out. And it came to pass, verse 8. You, you know, don't you? You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know. Jonah wrote this. You know he's leaving a lot out. I mean, it's bad enough. You imagine how he is losing his mind over some of this? I mean, he's just hysterical. Verse 8, it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it's better for me, like he said in verse 3, better for me to die than to live. And God said, at least 
Jonah's quoting God. At least Jonah's going in God. At least Jonah's saying, this is what I am, this is what I said, but this is what God did, this is what God said. Verse 9, and God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry? Your problem is always your problem, and God knows it, and God always asks the same question. He always tries to get to the root of the matter. Doest thou well, verse 9, to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry. Did you hear him? You don't say that like, oh, yes, Lord, I prayed about it. I do well to be angry. It's got a crummy attitude. Verse 10. He said, I'm so angry, I want to die. Verse 9, verse 10. Then said the Lord, thou has had pity on the gourd. For the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between the right hand and the left hand and also much cattle? You know what you do? You judge people all the time by their attitude. You'll say it to yourself, if you're with your wife, your husband, you'll say it to them. I don't know who your favorite people are, but I don't like being around people with a bad attitude. I mean, it just kind of sucks the life out of me. You know, they're, they're like, goodbye. I, I don't want to be around that. And yet we miss it in us. God knows what we are. God knows what we were. And God knows what we're going through right now. And he's patient with us. The story is so simple. God calls Jonah to work for him. Jonah in chapter 1 has the wrong attitude. And that wrong attitude led Jonah to disobey God. In his disobedience, follow me now, follow me, follow me. In his disobedience, he finds a ship and heads in the opposite direction. I know you know this. I know, I know, I know. He heads in the opposite direction that he should be going. Man, this guy's a preacher. You think he'd know you can't get away from God. I tell you, your attitude does something to you. You, you think crooked. The Bible calls it froward. You think perverted. He thinks he can get God to go this way, and he says, I'll, I'll go this way. And he thinks he's going to get away because he finds his ship. He gets on the ship. In fact, he falls asleep. But then all of a sudden the storm hits and the sailors, the mariners are terrified. They know they're going to die and they don't understand. This is so unusual to them that something is out of place here. So they track Jonah down and they nail him and say, something wrong here. We've done this trip a multitude of times, never had this problem. You show up, and we're all going to die. Jonah says, you got me. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm a preacher. I know God. I know what I'm doing. I, I should be here, but I'm there. And I'll tell you what, if you throw me off, you'll be okay. They said, we're not going to do that. You just hold on. So he held on. And as they rode, the Bible says, to try to get to land and, and beat this storm, didn't work. Finally, they said, you know what? We're not going to die. Let's take the advice of that preacher. So they went and grabbed the preacher, and they threw him overboard. Immediately, the storm stopped. Immediately, they looked at each other and said, Wow. Jonas tread water. They said, bye. Bye. Good luck. All of a sudden, their eyes get real big. 
a giant seahorse. That's what it is in the original language. A giant sea, a giant fish swallows him whole. Takes him for a ride, chapter 2. The Bible says, then. Chapter 2, verse 1, then Jonah prayed. How come he didn't pray when he got on the ship? How come he didn't pray when God said go to Nineveh and he went to the other? How come he didn't ask God if that would be the right thing to do? Now he's in trouble. All of us pray when we're in trouble. Lost people pray when they're in trouble. So we think, but he doesn't. We think Jonah gets his heart right, but he doesn't. So how do you know that? Chapter 4. You can go through the motions and still have a crummy attitude. You can serve God, and God can do great. Listen, that explains how a preacher can be a drunk, or an adulterer, or be in some other wicked sin, and God still bless. Because God blesses his word, and he blesses actions. But that person ultimately will pay for what they're doing. God's word does not return void. An evil, wicked man can get up and preach the word of God. The blessing's on the word of God. The blessing's not on that man, though. Jonah gets spit out on shore. The whale brings him close, spews him up on land. He wipes himself off. God says, hey, remember me? Remember what I asked you to do? Jonah said, hey, I don't want to go through that again. God says, I tell you what, if you go to Nineveh and you preach this little message, walk through the town, preach the message, I'll take care of everything. Jonah says, as long as I don't have to ride in that whale again, I'll go. And he gets to Nineveh, he hates these people, he sees these people, he preaches to them, he knows that they're the enemy of Israel. He knows the history of the Ninevites and how they've tortured the Jewish people. And he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to talk to them. He didn't want to be in their town. He didn't want to look at them. He didn't want to have any involvement called prejudice. He gets through the town, the whole town, not because of Jonah's preaching, not because of Jonah's attitude, but because of the message that Jonah delivered. The whole town turns around. The mayor of the town said, hey, I want the animals getting right with God. And the whole town gets right with God. That means they're no longer the enemy. That means they're no longer someone that Jonah should hate. That means everything's good. Jonah's done his job. God's done his job. He ought to be thrilled. Chapter 4. Jonah is completely negative to all that God did. Follow me now. Let me wind it. Stay with me. Stay right with me. Jonah is completely negative. To all that God did, he was being, I hate this word, but I'm guilty of it, and so are some of you. Jonah was being petty. I didn't say pretty. I said petty. Some of us are petty. Well, I just don't think. I, you know what? If you start that talk with me, I don't have time for that. I mean, there, there's too much in life that's important for you and I to fuss over petty things. Jonah, watch me now, follow me. Minor things became more important to Jonah than an entire city turning to God. That's what happens when you have a bad attitude. Look at me. Watch me. Watch me. You know what a bad attitude does to you? It causes you to go, this is the most important thing in the world. When Jonah, watch, watch, watch. When Jonah couldn't get what he wanted, what did he say? Why? I'd just as soon die. 
That to me is the epitome of a crummy attitude. I preach. I, here's what I think. Let, let me tell you what I think. Every this morning, while I preach, every one of you, moms, dads, I don't care if you've got a pet frog in your pocket, he should have came down to this altar and got his heart right. That's what I think. But it's not up to me to coerce or force you to make a decision. It's up to me to do what God wants me to do and to have a good attitude after I do it. That's the struggle. I know what you think. Everybody get up there and yell at people. Yeah, but when the people don't respond to the yelling, it's easy to get a bad attitude. Get crummy about it. They're not listening. They hate me. I won't hate them, but I know they hate me. Jonah, Jonah did not believe that God did the right thing. He said, remember what I told you about? Jonah was all against the saving Nineveh. And Jonah's plan for the future, Nineveh wasn't in it. As far as Jonah was concerned, the best thing for Nineveh would be if God destroyed the whole place. Hey, you know what? It's okay to have an opinion. But you better make sure that you and God are in tune. You better make sure that you're doing what God wants and, and you're looking at it the way he wants you to look at it. He was obedient, but his attitude did not change. He's no different than he was in chapter 1. I want to show you something. Numbers chapter 20. Find that. Numbers. The book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. Old Testament, I think. Numbers chapter 20. I'm not sure. I don't have time to read the Bible. Numbers chapter 20. Verse 1. If you're not looking at it, please listen. Numbers 20, verse 1 says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zen. In the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Verse 2, there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Verse 3, and the people chode. That means they, they, they grappled, they wrestled. The people chode with Moses and spake, saying, What God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? You know, what a cop out. I mean, if you've got a bad attitude, you get on your knees. You get right with God and ask Him to change you. Don't just say, I, I think I'll just die. That doesn't fix anything. I'm not playing. I'm leaving this church. That doesn't fix anything. Somebody who leaves this church with a wrong attitude is taking that wrong attitude to the next church. That's why we preachers will talk. They'll go, hey, how's this person? I'll go, they got a bad attitude. You know what they'll say to me? I thought so. When you carry that with you, you don't see it, but other people see it. You don't fix it by not fixing it. You fix it by saying, hey, there could be something wrong with me. I want to do what God wants. I want to be humble before God. They said, verse 3, what to God that we had died. What they're going to, they don't have water. They're so upset they don't have water. They said, we, we'd be better off dead. Is that total nonsense? Verse 4, and why, they said to Moses, why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in uh, uh, unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Verse 6, and Moses and Aaron went 
from the presence of the assembly under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I hope you're looking at this. Verse 6, and they fell upon their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Hey, can you imagine if this was Peter and Aaron? There would have been heads laying all over. What's Moses do? Gets down and begs God. He and Aaron go before God. And the Lord, verse 7, spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod. Gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. Thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So shalt thou give the congregation and their beasts drink. See the answer to the problem in God's eyes? The answer to the problem in God's eyes is give water. Hello? Ta-da! I mean, that's kind of simple, isn't it? Just reading that, I get all worked up. Why, those ungrateful, good, I'm going to pray God sends lightning bolts. Kill ya, I'll show you, kill ya. Moses says, God, we don't know what to do. They're yelling at us. They're choking with us. They hate us. They're not, they're not, hey, they got a bad attitude. God, you know what God said? I'll get them. What did God say? I'll get water. They need water. I'll send water out of a rock. God tells Moses, here's what you do. You go to the rock, you speak to the rock. When you speak to the rock, it'll gush forth water. They'll get water, they'll be fine. Wow. Where'd you learn that, God. Verse 9, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. I think he's exactly right. I think they were rebels. But it wasn't his place or the time to say it. What God would have, hey, God can take care of your enemy. The harder you try, the worse you look. You got to give them to God. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You got to give that to God. Moses gathers them. I read this, I'm like, go man, go. You rebels. I would have shook that stick. You've seen me split the Red Sea. I'm going to hit this rock, and it's going to give forth. Well, I ought to hit you. I mean, he's upset. He's given up his life. He's leading these children of Israel, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, across the desert. He said, here now, verse 10, here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And what did God tell him to do? Speak to the rock. You know what? You're going to let your bad attitude and your anger take you where you shouldn't go. Then what? Then what? Look how gracious God is. Moses does everything but cuss him out. Then he hits the rock. And water comes forth. Did God tell him to cuss him out almost and, and hit the rock? No. He said, you speak to that rock. You show them that you believe me. They'll believe you. You just speak to that rock. What great faith it will a, a, a display to them. What an example of faith. You, you talk and, and it'll, it'll be okay. Moses, these are words to this day. Do you ever think about something? Man, I could talk myself into a laugh. Somebody doesn't say anything, they don't have to, because I know what they're thinking. I've been sarcastic. Someone says something, that's why I hate texting. I'll get a text and I'll think, 
how they mean that? Should I be mad? I don't know how they meant this. But when I see your face and hear your voice, I know exactly what you mean. So I need you, if you're mad at me, you need to put some exclamation points in there. You need to put some mean-looking emojis. Some of you need to get up on texting. You need to put everything in bold so I know you're upset. Moses is upset. He lets them know that. And it says there, he took, he gathered them together. He called them rebels. He said, we got to take care of you. He smites the rock. Verse 11, twice the water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their beasts also. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Did Moses have the right attitude? Of course not. Did God do what he said he would do? Don't you let yourself be fooled because God stays God and you act like a jerk or jerkette. Don't you think that God's happy with that because he's not. God can't be anything other than God. It's you and I who need the adjustment. What happens? Look at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. He said, because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. I don't know what you see there in that story, but I see Moses struggling with his attitude. God never asked him to preach to the people and smack the rock. Hear this, hear this. The attitude that Moses had kept him out of the promised land. Moses never entered, he spent his whole life, 80 years, waiting to enter the promised land, waiting to lead God's people into the promised land, waiting to enjoy the land of milk and honey, and he doesn't go. Why doesn't he go? All because of a bad attitude. That scares me to death. Doesn't say he slept with a prostitute. Doesn't say he got drunk. It doesn't say that he murdered anyone. Doesn't say he robbed a bank. Doesn't say he got himself a boyfriend. Doesn't say he got himself another girlfriend. It says he had a bad attitude. James chapter 1. I'm stopping there. Would you join me there? James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 19 and 20 says this, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 20 says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. God wants us to be quick and ready to hear him. We're here to learn and to grow. And if we can have a good attitude, that will help us get all that we can from God and a good attitude will help us to get all we can from what we're going through. Man, I hate this message. I should have preached like that. I'm much better in a bad attitude than I am in a good attitude. I've got the bad one down. Verse 19, God says through James, slow to wrath. I know, I, know, I know you like swift to hear, slow to speak. But I think the one that really gets us, the one that, that marries itself, that couples itself with a bad attitude is that slow to wrath. And I think he's talking there about learning to control your temper, but I think he's also talking about the fact that we need to learn to control our attitude. He says in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved, Wherefore, my beloved brethren. You know what? We're sons of God. 
We're sons of God, and he expects us to act like that and show others what God looks like. He says in verse 19, let every man, let every man, let every man. That means that we can choose. If you don't learn, if I don't learn to control myself, then I will end up disobeying God just like Jonah. It's possible you've got to know that. Anger or a bad attitude will make you doubt what God says. And we don't need that. Anger never takes you. Verse 20 of James says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Anger never takes you on the right road. It will never help you to love God's truth. The Ninevites were not Jonah's problem. Jonah's problem was fulfilling what God asked him to do. When you do what God wants you to do, you better say, God, help me with my attitude. Even though I don't like them, I don't like what's happening, I need to do what you want, and I, Lord, want to have the right attitude about whatever happens. We don't do that. Jonah came to a conclusion I'm back there. You don't have to even open it. Jonah came to a conclusion about Nineveh. Jonah came to a conclusion about what he thought God wanted when he was angry. I don't know about you. I don't make good decisions when I'm angry. He didn't think that the Ninevites were worth his time. But it's that or the belly of a whale. That's like saying, well, I, you know, I know right from wrong. I don't think our struggle is right and wrong. I think our, our struggle is best and good enough. I think we've settled for good enough when God saved us and can do in us and through us and show others what's best. The bad attitude that Jonah had caused him to reject what God says. And the book of Jonah ends, and we wonder what happened to his attitude. And all I know is this. Hopefully, he sat there in his booth, and he looked out on the people in Nineveh, and he saw what God did. And I think one of the reasons that God allowed the book of Jonah to be included in the canon of Scripture is because I think, just my theological opinion, I'm the smartest theologian I know. I think, I think he sat there a while. I think he stared at the city. I think God broke his heart. When you belong to God, the Bible says, if ye be without chastisement, you don't belong to God. But Hebrews 12 says, when God chastens you, it yields righteousness. I don't think God's going to look bad. I think we don't know, but I think it's pretty safe to assume that Jonah, hey, 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 look at me, look at me. I think it's safe to assume that Jonah changed his attitude. Huh? How could you not? Man, if he didn't change his attitude, he's lost. And God can't use him if he's lost. So even though we don't know about it, I think God allowed that book into the scriptures. Because after time, I don't know how much time it'll take you, but God's got all the time in the world. And God will wait for you and God will wait for me until we change our attitude. Of course, of course, 
the best time would be tonight. If God's working on you, if he's speaking to you, you ought to just give him, you ought to sacrifice, lay down your attitude right on this altar. Let God give you the attitude he wants you to have. He's working on me. He's working on me. It's a struggle. I, I'd rather try to fight nicotine. Look at me, really. I, I'd rather, I'd rather struggle, because you can go, I'm not having a cigarette. I'd rather struggle with, with booze. I'm not having a beer. All the people I'm around, almost, most of the people, when I come to church, you don't tempt me to smoke. You don't tempt me. I shouldn't say this. You've got to take this right. If you don't take this right, I'll have to look for another job. You don't tempt me to smoke, and you don't tempt me to drink, but you tempt me to have a bad attitude. And I certainly don't want to tempt you to have a bad attitude. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you said one of the reasons that we come together in church is to provoke one another to love and good works how sad that we let what someone says or what someone does cause us to have a bad attitude when I come to church I'm not tempted to cuss and swear when I come to church I'm not tempted to go have a cigarette when I come to church I'm not tempted to go have a drink but sometimes I allow I allow the actions of others or the attitude of someone else. I allow that to hurt or to twist my attitude. Dear God, I give you my attitude tonight. Again, I've been giving it to you. I've been laying it down. I've been throwing it at you. I've been throwing it away. I just want to have an attitude that exalts you. I want to have an attitude that others can copy. I want to have an attitude that causes others to want to love God more. I want to rejoice in the things I ought to rejoice in. Lord, I, I, I can't speak for anybody. I, I wouldn't try to speak for my wife. I wouldn't try to speak for my kids. I wouldn't try to speak for people in this church that I know well. I know I can only speak for me. And they're going to have to do the same. They would like to speak for someone else, but they can't. They shouldn't. They can only speak for them. May they tonight see you do such a supernatural work in their attitude. Be it their attitude about work. Be it their attitude about marriage. Be it their attitude about this church. Be it their attitude about the world. Be it the attitude about their wife, their husband, their kids. Be it their attitude about their in-laws. Be it their attitude about co-workers. Be it their attitude about anyone or anything else. May tonight you have full reign. May you have the freedom to help us develop the attitude that we ought to have. With your head bowed, with your eyes closed. Yes, 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 I'm going to put you on the spot. You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. With your head bowed, with your eyes closed, you say, Preacher, God is speaking to my heart. And I don't always speak to you. Don't judge me for what you think I might be thinking about you. I'm just saying to you tonight, you admit, you admit, you say, Preacher, God speaking to my heart. God is speaking to my heart. Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Slip it high, slip it high, slip it high. Up and down, up and down. Slip it high. Others, here's my hand, preacher. God speak to me up and down, up and down. Look, I'm not trying to see them all. I'm trying to get you to say, here's what I need to do. I'm not going to hold you accountable. I've never have, never will. Never come to you and go, hey, you know you raised your hand. This is you. You've got to take care of this. Last call. Preacher, God's working on me. Something I need to, I, I need to, uh, bring something to the altar and leave it there and I need to come up there and get from God I hope what, what I need and I'm going to start and I want that to happen whether it happens tonight I'm, it's going to happen 
I want to happen. I don't want to just do what I ought to. I want to have the right attitude about what I do for God. If that's you, you haven't raised your hand, say, here's my hand, preacher. God's speaking to me. There's something that I, I want to take care of tonight, tonight, tonight. Dear, dear Lord, there's a sweet spirit this church always has been. We've always been open with each other. And we're just sinners. We all get along so well because we all realize we're just a bunch of sinners. And we're trying to do the right thing, trying to be godly, and trying to live right. And our biggest problem is not that we're sinners. Our biggest problem is that we don't think we're sinners. So, God, you work on us tonight. You just bring us low and then lift us up. You're the one that said, you said it, Lord. You said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You said that. So I pray tonight you'll do that for us. And I ask it in Christ's name. Piano plays. You're standing. Piano plays. You're standing. If you're going to come, come on. Come on. If you need me, I'll be up here. If I look like I'm praying, I might be. Uh, uh, just bother me if you need me. Come on. Come on. You're standing. She's playing. Do what you got to do. the thing that really scares me about Jonah he didn't think he had a bad attitude I think that's why he sat there a while I think he stared at Nineveh I think he talked to God tomorrow I don't think he told us about it but I think it happened I, I guess I hope it happened and then wow when he saw it when he realized man I've got a terrible attitude here I did this, I didn't want to do it, but I did it. I didn't have the right attitude, and I ran, and I should be excited. He, he thought, and he told himself, I should be excited about what God did. You and I ought to be excited about what God does. Our attitude shouldn't look like we're mad, or we think God should do something else. God's going to be God. One more time. Can she do it? Maybe just for me. But she's going to play it through one more time if you need to come. Some of you, you know, you don't do it much, but maybe you need to come back. Maybe you went back to your seat, saw something, thought, man, I need to go back. Don't, don't hesitate to do that. Just be honest. Be honest with God. He knows what you are. You could stand there and act like everything's good. God knows what you are. We want God to change you. I want God to change me. Chorus. Chorus, you, you come if you need to come. Come on. If I knew what I know now about Jonah, I'd never have him speak at this church. Never. It's all about attitude. Isn't how great a preacher you are? Man, he preached and things happened like nothing has ever happened. It's about your attitude. Dear Father, we can look good. We can sound good. We can put on a show. But after a while, our attitude comes out. Sweeten us up. Dear Lord, make us sweet. May our lives be a sweet-smelling savor unto you. Make us sweet. I know that we're all so much alike. There's stuff that bothers us and we fuss over. And man, usually it's just little goofy junk. But it's not helping the cause of Christ. It's not helping this church. Help us to worry about us. Help us not to worry about what you're doing. Help us not, not to worry about what you're doing in someone else. Help us to worry about what you're doing in us. 
Bless us tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in me, what you're trying to do in me, and I'm sorry that I stop you so often. Thank you for what you're doing in other lives and hearts. Thank you, thank you. God help us, please help us. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.